It's time once again for the Real People Multi Game Solitaire Mega Tournament. Before I get on to the exciting news about what we're going to be doing in this uh, leg of the tournament, which is going to be the Pope leg, um, I'd like to extend an apology to Tony Clifton and anyone else who is really looking forward to um, the days of Decision 2, Europa 1945 to 2030, uh, Imperial 2030 slash Megacorp. Uh, series that I was going to do for this leg. This leg's gone through, this will be the second, I guess, third? Yes. Yeah, the second drastic change of this leg. Originally it was going to be Animal Farm. I didn't love Animal Farm Solitaire once I got into it. When I designed the tournament, including the Animal Farm thing, I hadn't played most of the games in the tournament, um, including Animal Farm. So I changed it, I scrapped Animal Farm, then I was going to do Days of Decision 2. Um, that, which which I still want I still think that that leg is going to be great for something. It just didn't seem to fit with this group anymore. Uh, this group that that's going to be part of this leg was um, the group that was in the Pablo Origin series. So if you haven't seen that, that's okay. You can still jump in. I don't know if I'm going to go through all of their personalities right off the bat. I already did that in Pablo Origins. So there's a lot of a lot of background on them in that. Uh, which is sort of extraneous to the Real People Multigame Solitaire Mega Turner, but yet connected. Um, the way that series ended up, however, didn't make me feel like the politics was the way to go. Um, it became less centered on their interrelationships between amongst each other. Uh, the game just kind of took that turn. And I, I didn't expect that. Um, so now we're going to be doing something that's more of a reflection of that Origins game. Uh, and that's going to be 7 by 7 Ages. So the base of the game is 7 Ages, which is um, a somewhat of a civilization game. It's more military on the military economic side. There isn't a lot of culture in it. Um, and so I was, I was thinking of doing that. Um, but then I thought... The, the spirit of the game Seven Ages was very similar to Duel of Ages in a lot of ways. Um, Seven Ages is kind of a, uh, it's got a taste of the war game in the strategic sense. Duel of Ages has a taste of the war game in the tactical sense. Maybe a more, more taste, more than a taste in both cases, but I, I really don't want to get into whether something's a war game or not, or how much war game it is. But they both have this kind of odd mix between war game and something else. Um, and they both have ages in the title, and they both have this weird time mashup going on. So there's this there's this odd connection between the games. They're both like accessible, but also very not accessible, you know. Um, and and so I wanted to combine those two. For so for a while I was going to be doing Duel of Seven Ages, which I didn't love the title, but it kind of fit it all. Um, something that I've been toying with with the tournament. Um, people tell me that what they like the best about the tournament is when I mash games up. And so I was doing this mashup here. But I've been wanting to mash up uh, more than two games and see what I could come up with with that. And so um, the other night, it was only a, a couple nights ago, I, I wasn't able to sleep and so I came up with the idea of putting in Seven Wonders, which isn't the same kind of spirit as the other two games. So it's a little different, but it, you know, the number thing, the name thing really uh, kind of made me go for it. Also, um, and so I've, I've combined them all. This video will probably just be mostly an overview of how I did that. Um, just because, I don't know, it's, it's going to be a long game, I will tell you. Playing Seven Ages by itself, for me, I can, I can get a turn done in a session, generally. Uh, like, you know, like a round of turns with everyone. And so that's going to be very slow, because there's going to be a lot of turns. Right, and I think you know, with the the mix up, the the mashup, it's it it maybe is going to be even a longer game than a typical Seven Ages game. Uh, I am going to be doing the full history uh, version of that, so things start in Age One. I I like that. I don't know. I like the the full the scope of history. I find that to be one of the strengths of the game, so I like to go through that. So let's let me let me go over uh, how things fit together, and then maybe we'll get started. Maybe we'll get started another time. Phew, so that was a lot of setup. And I, I fear this is probably going to be how this this um, series goes. It's it's going to be very big and very long, but I think a lot of it is going to be off camera because there's a lot of just moving things around and thinking. So what I just did was I moved all the 
counters up there. Isn't that pretty? Um, so if we look up here, we have 15 different colors of counters. Now each player is going to get two, two colors that um, are just theirs for as long as they're in the game. And I say as long as they're in the game for a reason because there is going to be player elimination which is going to be really sad. I'm going to have to say goodbye to these guys who I've been with for months now um, as the game goes on. But I'll get into that. So each player gets a pair of colors. Uh, each of the colors is a different counter mix and some of the Basically, one of the colors is more plentiful, and the other color has stronger units. So, if we take a look at Melky's people here, you'll see his orange color has stronger units in general than his yellow color. So, you can see these, this guy is one stronger than that guy. All right, and then there's a black color, which no one gets proprietary um, control of. It's just whoever starts a third emp empire first gets that color. Um, and then as people are eliminated, their colors will go into the general pile that everyone can can pick from. All right, so that's what's going on there. That's kind of basic Seven Ages stuff, nothing new there. I had to move the counters up there because the players are going to have Duel of Ages characters in their area here. Um, in Seven Ages, the different cards have leader ratings on them. And that's how many leaders they can have. Basically the Duel of Ages characters are going to be the Seven Ages leaders. Uh, a little different than Seven Ages though, they're going to be able to move along the map independently and do some like cloak and dagger stuff and also go through their labyrinths and whatnot. Um, I actually haven't set up the labyrinth areas yet, but I'll talk to you about that in a second. Um, I haven't decided exactly when the 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 drop-off areas are going to be on this progress track. I was thinking originally when um, we get to the third, the end of the third age, someone will drop out, and then the fourth, fifth, sixth, and finally the seventh, and then we're going to have a duel of wonders after that. But I might, I might make the first one be at this, this first dark age here. These, these colored areas are dark ages. I haven't decided yet. Um, I think that might be better actually with the flow of the game. Um, so, anyways. As time goes on, we're going to have certain points on these tracks, and whoever is the lowest on the glory track, which is victory points in this game, um, is going to be dropped off at that point. So that's kind of all the information there. The Duel of Ages connection is pretty straightforward. I mean, the characters are going to be on the map. They're going to have leader abilities like Seven Ages, but they're mainly going to be doing their own thing, I imagine, because there's some fun stuff they can do. Um, so let's look at Seven Wonders now. Let's see. So no sooner did I get a large table than I played a game that filled it up. For a while I was playing two games simultaneously on that table and I was able to set up another one here. But now I'm doing one game that takes up all the space. Now if you notice I have the Seven Wonders boards on the floor. That's because I'm going to be needing this surface for um, uh, when the leaders have tactical combat. I'm not doing tactical combat with the units and I'm not having the leaders fight with the units. They can affect unit combat just as a leader but um, I'm going to say they're not as strong as an army and just make it make it like that. So here we have our, our different players boards. Um, Rhodos, that was Melky. Halicarnassus, that was um, I want to say Flush. And then, yeah, I, ha I, I was kind of silly. I put them in a different order than they're actually seated over there. I should probably change that. That would be a lot easier for me to remember. Uh, there's Runts. Runt has Babylon. Alexandria, that would be um, Little Red. So they're kind of in order. Uh, Cowboys, Olympia, or Olympus. Um, Giraffe has Giza. And Thesis is cat as in cat. So I'll be moving these around. But basically let's take a look at some of our cards and I'll just kind of give you an overview of what they do. Um, so Seven Wonders is also a simultaneous action selection game. I'm not going to go into how to play the game, but these brown cards basically are just used to build things. Uh, same with these gray cards. These red cards are going to have a military effect in um, Seven Ages. So basically, you know, before every turn, someone's people are going to have a hand of cards, which are going to get passed at the end of the turn, and they're going to get to play a card. So if you have um, military cards, your army is going to be better. Um, oh, I, I didn't even mention this. So kind of what I envision the Seven Ages kind of cities being, they're going to affect all the person's um, empire, right? Empires. So if we go back over here, um, you know, Melky's likely going to have two, maybe three 
empires, especially for the first part of the game, and then if you survive, so you'll have more. They're all going to have a similar kind of like cultural connection, and that is going to be seen through here. So, you know, what they what they put weight on as a culture, do they value, you know, hard work and production and craftsmanship? Do they value military? That's going to make a difference for um, the other, their, their empires. Uh, more production there, more production. Okay, so here we have science. Science. Whoever has the most science is going to be the ones who get the free progress at the end of um, a, a Seven Ages turn. Normally, everyone gets the free progress, but I'm I'm changing it so just whoever is the most scientifically advanced, um, whoever has the most points worth of science, and there's some calcula calculations to be made to see who has the most points. And then also, if they have the science comes in three different symbols. If you have the most of a particular symbol, your Duel of Ages leaders are going to get an advantage. What I tried to do when combining with these, these uh, I did it fairly simply. For one, I tried to keep the games as intact as possible because they're all kind of have their own balance to them. Um, but I also, you know, in connecting them, I tried to connect each game to the other two games. Um, and I tried to have their effect be relative so I didn't have to come up with any hard values for the most point part. So, um, you know, like the science, it's, it's not how much flat science you have, it's whether you have more than someone else that's going to make a difference. Um, I think the, the military cards might have a lot to do with, yeah, I'm, it's coming back to me, with um, when the, the Duel of Ages leaders try to do something in um, someone else's territory, uh, the number of of these these symbols that they have is going to affect how hard it is for that leader. So it's basically their defenses. Now these um, these I'm pretty happy with. I, I actually haven't tested any of this out uh, because the game's just so long and I just kind of want to get it going and get it out of my head. Um, these blue cards, uh, and they're the main source of these wreath symbols. You can get them other places as well. You see in these wonders. Whoever has the most of those wreaths, or well, I, okay, so there's the events in Seven Ages. Let's go look at those. Um, there's all these mighty events that you can do to people. A lot of them are take, take that or screwage type events. Um, that you could do to someone. I'm saying you can only do an event like that to someone if you have more of those wreaths than they do. It's a kind of simple thing, but it should kind of limit um, how much of these do. And it, it kind of fits thematically. A lot of these um, blue cards, like here we have an altar, you know, it's things that appease God or um, theater, give you some good karma, you know, it's the arts and the religion stuff. Yellow cards are going to help when you're trading. Um, you know, if they add to the trade rating of the different empires, the more yellow cards you have. And uh, which will make the trade action a lot better. It's kind of, it's somewhat less desirable, especially in a seven player game of seven ages, because it's just, it just feels weaker. Sometimes you have to use it in order to advance, but um, I think it'll definitely be more useful in this game. One, because the science, the use of science is going to inhibit advancement in our seven ages, and also, um, these cards are going to add your trade rating, which make it so that you can get more money off of it. I'm using the errata, which lets you go do trade. And then is that? That's it. That's all four. Okay, so that's basically how that's going to work. It's going to be a smallish part of the game, but it's going to have some great effects or big effects, I think. Um, one thing different between regular Seven Ages and this is uh, when you have to discard an empire or when you choose to, you're going to lose some of those cards and they're going to get cycled back around. So. Sometimes it might be that there aren't any cards for Seven Ages because, you know, the Age 2 cards aren't going to come in until someone's in, until the game is in Age 2, which the game is in the age of whoever's furthest along on this track. Um, there's Seven Ages. And I think that's basically it. I think we'll, we'll go into playing. Oh, maybe, maybe I'll talk about the um, Labyrinth spots after I get those set up. Okay, so I'm actually going to be borrowing from two other games for this one little part of um, the game. I'm not really combining the games per se, but I'm using them for information. So one of the games, I'm, uh, in order for someone to go into uh, the labyrinth, which I, even, I can't actually remember what going into the labyrinth does. I think it gets you glory points if you're furthest along. Um, in order for someone to go into the labyrinth, they have to go to particular places. And, you know, where am I going to figure out, how am I going to figure out what where those places are that they have to go adventure. Because this is them going off adventuring uh, alone and they're gonna find something that's age appropriate 
and have to deal with it. Um, well, I'm, I'm figuring out from this game, 2012 the Mayan calendar. In 2012 the Mayan calendar, um, which it, it, it's the big thing in the Mayan calendar, is supposed to happen next month, so I should review the game soon. Um, they have these different places of power. So I'm going to use these places of power to mark where the labyrinth is, where you can access the labyrinth on the world map. So this will be my little map, and I'll just transpose that on there. And then the other game I'm going to use is Timberland, which is a game I got at Goodwill, but it has these nice little yellow trees, and these are going to mark the places of power. I actually took these out of Timberland and put them in my Mayan game, because I use it for that game. Okay, so there we have our trees set up. If if a leader, which is going to be represented by one of these hexagonal figures here, that's a Duel of Ages character, they look like this, that's what their card looks like, there's Dingo Jake. Uh, if a leader ends up one of there, they can choose to adventure. Now they have a number of options of what they can do when they maneuver, depending on where they are. Um, that's going to let them challenge the labyrinth, and the labyrinth, what the labyrinth is, is going to change as time goes on. Um, and I think... I think what I decided is whoever, when you challenge a labyrinth, if you're successful, your marker is going to go forward. Whoever's marker is the furthest along is going to get a number of points uh, at the end of the turn equal to um, how many spaces they are in front of the person in front of them. So at the very least one point, but they could get more. It could be a source of big points if you're the only one going for the labyrinths. Um, there's also, each age has a, a secondary thing. The ancient age has a royal festival there. In order to challenge any of the festival areas, um, which if you get them all, which is gonna be really hard in a seven person game, normally it's a duel. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll change the number you have to get. Um, if you get, all six areas in the standard game, you are, you get a free character, a free leader, and that's going to be above and beyond the the player's limit, um, and probably some glory too. I think I'll say if whoever has the most markers on there gets a glory marker, a glory point at the end of every turn. I guess I should start playing. I should quit explaining, and I'll just talk about it as I go along. So I've played Seven Wonders solo before. I don't know if I did seven deck seven hands, um, or seven seven players. I think I probably did three, um, likely just to learn the game. Uh, I didn't really enjoy it solo before. I like it a bit more now because it's connected to something broader. Um, simultaneous action games, with the exception of Shogun, are take a long time. So Solitaire, uh, Seven Ages is an example of that. Um, and card games are not generally that fun for me, Solitaire. But uh, I think with the connection with everything else, it's it's better. So I rearranged them in seating order now. Um, Flush, he did some science. And so, oh, basically the game, you're going to have a hand of cards. You pick one of these, the cards to, that you can play, and then you pass them. He actually had to uh, spend, give some money to... Um, to Kaz and Cat in order to put down his his science card because he needed to use her resource. Um, you can you can buy things from the people to either side of you. Though I might change it so that you can. Uh, nah, nah. I'll probably keep with that. It's I, I could I could harken back to Seven Ages. But what I was gonna say is originally as written this was actually this part with the cards was going to be the same at the same time when they did their action selection on the other board but since I have to go back and forth um, I guess it'd be good exercise for me it's just uh, I, I kind of want to try and be make things quicker when possible so there they made these selections without knowing what kind of hands they have or what actions they're going to choose though pretty much everyone's going to be choosing start Empire or um, destiny depending um, so Kaz and Cat, she went for resources. Um, Melky, he did a trading post, pointed at Cowboy there, which was nice because Cowboy got resources. They knew Cowboy pretty well. Um, Giraffe did the same thing. It kind of was just what cards came up, it, but it's it's interesting that he got a bunch of resources and they each got things that let that gave them a, a discount basically when they're buying resources from Cowboy. Um, and then. Little Red, sorry, it's I, I have to process a second who's who because I don't have the cards over here. I have them at the other table. Um, Little Red did science, and then um, Runt, she got this thing where she can trade for these resources for cheap for either side of her, which is nice. All right, we're getting started. I, um, I changed a couple of rules 
for the sake of just my own peace of mind. One rule is uh, this, normally you bid cards to see who gets to start. Um, I just decided to let Giraffe start. She, it was her, her turn to be first um, in the last game I was playing. And then I'm using mulligan rules. So if you don't have a, a, a valid em empire in your hand when you start off, you can discard your hand and just draw six instead of seven. Um, I think Runt and Melky both had to use that. Everyone else had an empire. So everyone's going to be starting empires this turn, starting with Giraffe. She's got the Harappans, which is useful for her. It looks like they benefit from trade. And she um, turns out she's lucky. She has a yellow card there. So that's going to give them a plus one on their trade. Normally they have a plus zero. Reason they benefit from, they'd also benefit from science. Um, they score victory points if they are the the furthest in progress. They also score victory points um, for having the most pieces in India, or the most areas in India held, and for having their homeland, which is Sindh, um, which is right there. If she can hold that, she'll get it. If she can hold that till 10, which is quite a while, she'll get an elephant. And Giraffe went with her more numerous popular uh, counter set. Reason being, she thought, you know, she can spread out more, she can get into trade contact with more empires, which is um, beneficial for her Harappans, she thinks. Um, uh, Little Red did the same thing. He he got the uh, ancient Iranians. They have an interesting quality that they're they're barbarians, right? Um, they. They don't. They can't build buildings, but in their case, they they are. It's nice. It's a nice sort of barbarianism because they don't have to stay in the same area. Normally, it, when you move from an area, you have to leave one unit behind. Um, the ancient Iranians don't, as long as they're in age one. So uh, little red also got numerous guys. I, he's just going to try and spread out and get a bunch of points from them. Probably not hang on to them. Uh, their scoring isn't the best. They have to. They have to really. They only score on having the most areas, and that's that's kind of hard to do, especially if you're not a super tough people. They're not bad, but they don't you know they don't have a lot of money to start with. Their trade rating isn't the best. I don't know. They don't they get two leaders, but they don't start with a leader. Unlike the Amazons, we have our first leader in play. Um, the Amazons start with Xena, so I actually I remembered one of the Duel of Ages leaders was an Amazon, a uh, Sienna. Sienya, uh, the queen's daughter, is an Amazon. So she's going to be uh, the stand-in for Xena for this game. She's a philosopher and a tactician. Tactician's useful if you're with an army. Um, so she may not want to go off on her own. But she has some nice movement capabilities that she can use if she's off on her own. Tactician, um, philosopher, I think they, they win ties on points, which is it happens frequently. So it's useful to have a leader like that. But they get a plus one move in Swamp. I'm going to say, hmm, i probably say that that would apply to the jungle. I guess there's no jungle up there. It's not super useful. Um, but there we go. forgot to mention another thing I kind of fudged is you're also, if you're the, the first one to start an empire, you get to ch choose your color then. I assigned everyone their colors beforehand. Partially because I've I've played a game of this with with the real people, a couple games of this with them, this group already, and I'm kind of got used to their colors. And it's just another thing to think about to have to go through this chart and weigh which color is best. You know, there there's something to that, but um, it's just it's a lot easier for me to process if I can just always associate blue with ca and yellow and orange with milky. Uh, it's a lot easier. So. Um, Flesh, he, he actually benefited some from Milky's experience with the Etruscans. He went with the more numerous uh, variety because he, he remembered not a lot develops in Castile and in Spain. So, he, uh, you know, Milky had a good shot at, uh, at spreading down here, held, held Rome. The Etruscans don't score on very many things, but they score on holding Italy. So that's, that's generally a point every turn as long as you can keep them healthy. Unfortunately, um, Cac... Kaz and Cat has her her galls here. She had the galls last game she played as well. And she went with the stronger ones because they score, they have a special scoring thing where if they just liberate from someone else that's higher up, then um, they get points for that. So she doesn't need to depend on holding territory as much. Um, of course, she can get three points if she has the most units in Europe. Uh, not a lot of Europeans right now, so she might be able to get quite a few points next turn after she maneuvers. Um, 
Melky, he has the Babylonians, which are useful for him. He also took a trading card to start with, uh, that yellow card. Where, where is he? Oh, over there. I think he's Rhodes, right? Um, and the Babylonians get, you know, they get stuff on money. They already start out with a good trade. They're a pretty good um, empire to have. And he made sure not to spend so much on starting units that he wouldn't be tops on money. So he's going to score a point off that right now. So I'll go through and do scoring and then kind of let you know how things start out. And then I'll probably end it for, for the night. I don't know how I almost forgot. Well, I know how I can explain it. I almost forgot Cowboy. The reason why I forgot is because, you know, I have this line here on this side of the map and then jumped, I forgot to jump over. We started with Giraffe. It's kind of a weird place to start. Um, he has kind of a bad starting uh, civilization for him, the Phoenicians. Phoenicians are interesting, um, but they, they work off trade and using their, their economic might and their, their, their Bodhi might. Uh, on on other people. That's not really cowboy style. Cowboy's actually done pretty well in this game, I've found. I don't know why. Um, but the Phoenicians are not really his bag. I mean, if you look, he's like one of the few people not trading. Well, I guess we got uh, about half the people aren't trading. But he's going to have a lot of people buying from him on that board. Uh, we'll see how he does with getting money. He kind of likes to spend his money. Another bad thing about the Phoenicians for cowboy is um, they would be good ones to get later. Their setup is plus zero, right, from the leader. But at the time that he started them, everyone was at one anyway. So he wasn't able to just equal out with everyone else. It would have been nice if he had another um, empire to start first, but he didn't, and he didn't want to wait. He wanted to get the Phoenicians down there. Also, um, one of their main benefits is, is uh, lower costs on galleys. Can't get galleys yet. Uh, so that's a bummer for him. Let's do points. Uh, well, I did the progress already. I guess I'll show you that. Little Red and um, Flush were the only two who were able to progress because they each have one science point in the game. My, fa my, my son is very upset about something. All right, we got a tight pack just to end our first round. Uh, Runt's currently in the lead. She got a, a bonus uh, two points because just because she has that philosopher with her, she won the tie on uh, having the most spaces in the world. Everyone has one, but since she has a philosopher, she wins the tie. She has two, and she has her homeland, so she got three points. Um, if she was able to progress as well, she would have won that tie. Also, that philosopher is pretty handy. Uh, second place, we have Melky, Giraffe, and um, Flush. Flush is doing pretty great. He has the most progress, and he's tied for second. And then last, we have Cat and Little Red. Not really a huge difference at this point in the game, but let's take a, I guess we can, we can guess at some things. Um, one, depending on what other empires start out here, Kaz gonna be coming for Flush there. I mean, these guys, they score on, on hurting others, and he's ahead of her on the progress chart, and he's, he's close by. So she's probably gonna come after him. Uh, maybe not at his capital, but somewhere around there. That could be interesting. Um, Run's going to have some choices to make regarding that one. Oh, and I forgot. I gotta get a. I gotta get a leader for uh, Melky here. Hammurabi. I don't. There's not a Hammurabi Duel of Ages character, but I might be able to find one that's somewhat close. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Um, other stuff. There's likely to be some things going on between these two. Um, I don't know if any of them are really, I mean, there's plenty of room right now, so there's a lot to be seen. Um, it'll be interesting to see where the ancient Iranians go. They don't have to stay here. Uh, they actually score on being in Europe, which is across this line here. They're in Asia right now, so they're probably not going to hold on to Transoxiana. Um, though, you know, they could they could just not worry about those points and go over here to, to take advantage of all the wheat, which is which is delicious. This wheat that's in forest is not useful until era four, so. All right, so I'm gonna draw randomly because I couldn't come up with anyone who was close to Hammurabi. I didn't look at all of them, but I'm just, I'm drawing randomly from the ancient deck and we'll see what leader um, Melky gets for his Babylonians. And it's Gregory. Gregory is the like holy monk, uh, kind of like St. Francis of Assisi sort of guy. I don't know why they didn't just call him St. Francis. Maybe it would have offended some Catholics. So that should be pretty interesting because um, Melky is actually kind of close to Runt, who has the Babylonian Siena. 
Um, Gregory's not really a combat person, neither is Sienna, but they might both be going for um, the same sort of uh, the same sort of labyrinth, and well, it'll be interesting to see how they interact. There's a lot um, with the honor and respect uh, in, for the characters in terms of what they can do to the other other uh, players. Uh, Gregory is honorable and respectful, so he can't really hurt the other empires so much. He can spread discord through propaganda, I believe. Um, it might be, they, you, we might see a grab for space around the Caspian Sea there, which is where the nearest, um, uh, I forget what those they are called, the, but the nearest portal, I guess, to the labyrinth is. Uh, so that's very interesting. We're embarking, or at least I am, and if you come with me, you're embarking as well on a rather long journey, I suspect. Um, I don't know if it'll be as long as Pablo Origins. I think it might be longer, <laughs> so we'll see. Uh, there's, a, I, 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 I'm reminded of when I was in, uh, college, uh, when I would sign up for classes, I would always sign up for things that were like, not like anything I would really want to uh, try necessarily as sort of a joke on my future self. This feels a little bit like that, although it is things I enjoy, and I, I was grateful for that in college as well. You know, I, I exposed myself to a lot of things I probably wouldn't have otherwise if I'd just gone for what was immediately interesting to my persona. Uh, so. Next time on the Real People Multi-Game Solitaire Mega Tournament, Pope Leg will continue 7x7 seven seven Ages.